but uh, I just want to introduce everybody, um, a, a special person in my life. It's uh, happens to be my father-in-law, but also uh, he's had a successful career before he was my father-in-law. <laughs> so I want to introduce John Caglione Jr. We're going to have a conversation today about life. We're going to talk about life as a Hollywood makeup artist. And uh, I always like to bring on what I call underdogs and people that didn't come from privileged situations and didn't come from sort of this special club with a special pedigree, um, but instead people that had to earn what it is that they have. So if you're a guest on my show, that's, that's pretty much how it started for you. So that's, that's where I guess we'll dig in. So I know a lot about you, but- You do, are, I, I should just, can I just ask you my questions? Cause yeah, you'll sure. be able to answer them. <laughs> Go ahead, kick it off. <laughs> so, how did I start? <laughs> Where did it all begin? I don't know. Yeah. Troy. It all Humble started in oh, New Troy. York. What a place. Yeah. yeah, that's right. Well, you know, we're all over the place. We can come from anywhere in this great country. Yeah, that's, so. I think that's what people forget is that, you know, sort of talent has no boundaries. You know, you can be a young baseball player in, in, in some of the jungle areas of the Dominican Republic and find your yeah. way to the big leagues. Or you can be an actor that, that started on a, you know, as, as a waiter or a waitress and came from nothing. Most of them do, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Sort of those humble be be beginnings and dreams. I mean, that's, you're talking about dreamers, you know, people that just, you know, they, they just, uh, they have a vision like you. Yeah, same well, kind of story, man. You know, it's almost yeah. the same thing. It's you like, had tunnel vision. You were focused on that. Which I think is common for most people that are sort of, you know, looking to go to the next level, whatever that next level is. You know, if you, you have to have a vision and you have to have some level of dream or else you'll oftentimes sort of stay still or stay where you are and succumb to the situation around you. So, yeah, I, I think it's almost like, a, you know, I mean, for me, I didn't really even know any better, but you, you kind of visualize it. You're, you're almost psychically willing it. Yeah. Uh, so for you, what, what, what was it? I mean, what, what drives, like, you know, you're, you're a kid growing up in upstate New York. Um, well, I wanted to get out of Troy. So there was some motivation there. No, yeah. it, it's great up there. I, I love it. I still, you know, you know, I drive up there and I hang out with my friends and, uh, it was just the movies, you know, like for you, it was baseball, right? It was just like, wow, that's something I think I could do. And uh, it was always the movies for me. And it was a way to kind of, it's a whole different world universe there. And uh, so I started like really watching films and didn't know exactly where I would go right away. And then kind of found effects makeup in the makeup biz and that, I was like, yeah, that's something I think I might be able to do. And But how do you get there? That's the, that's the whole trick. Yeah, and that, that's a, the big question for many people. There's a lot of people that oftentimes feel stuck, right? They're, they're in these situations and they don't know how they're going to get out or what even getting out looks like because they've never seen anybody get out. So yeah, how, how do you go from upstate New York to, to Hollywood and the big screen? How does that all work? Yeah, you know, it's just, um, you start writing fan letters to people, I think. You start trying to reach out. Well, you know, I think at a certain point, after just playing around with that stuff on my own and starting to get pretty decent with it, then I started to think, well, maybe it's time for me to start reaching out to a few people. And I wrote some letters. And uh, I actually wrote a letter to, the first letter I wrote was to the, the makeup artist that did Planet of the Apes, John Chambers. Hmm. And that that those films were really big in the uh, early to mid 70s, the Planet of the Apes series. Okay. And it just captured everyone's imagination. So I, I wrote a letter to John Chambers and I got a very nice letter back uh, from Hollywood. And it was like, well, we're not looking for anyone right now, but we have your name on file. And then the second letter I wrote, I didn't know where, the, well, it was Dick Smith. This, the makeup guy that did the makeup in The Exorcist and the Godfather movies, he aged Marlon Brando. I was a big fan of his. And I, 
I didn't have his address, so I wrote to the Linda Blair fan club because Linda Blair was the possessed girl in The Exorcist. So I found her, you know, her her uh, fan club at Warner Brothers Studios in Hollywood, and I wrote a letter and I mailed it. And I, I guess I put my phone number on the letter. And like a month later, I was playing football in the street with my friends, and my mother yells out the window, "Dick Smith's on the phone." So wow. he actually called me on the phone. And he was that kind of guy. He was very, very uh, tangible. You know, he was just a great, and that's what really got me started professionally was through Dick Smith. Yeah, I, I have to ask this question because I know people are probably wondering, you know, because, you know, typically makeup is not a, you would think is a male driven, you know. Yeah. Industry. So like, you know, as a young guy, what sparks your interest in it? What, what was the, the capture? What was the grab where you said, you know what, I, I want to get involved with makeup. Yeah, it's weird. And especially back then, I mean, when I started to like look at, it was the monster movies. It was all the old horror movies, like the old Frankenstein films, Boris Karloff. And those were, I mean, I was terrified watching them. It really just grabbed me. Mm -hmm. So for a guy uh, back in the late 60s, early 70s, those, those films were the ones that were like, oh no, this is like, how do you do that? That's, that's just amazing. So it was, the, it, was, it was those particular films that were yeah. like, so, that's, so, that's, that's special. That's out of the ordinary. Yeah, no, I'd say before all yeah. the, I guess the, com the computer graphics and all the enhancements. Oh yeah, long before all that. Yeah, it was all physically done right on the stage, on the set. Yeah, that's cool. That's cool. Yeah. And you know what, I, well, you know what, there's a lot of people that, that, that are gonna watch this and, and are gonna say, you know what, you know, we're probably thinking, how do I get a break in life or what can I do to sort of get to that next place. And what's cool is saying, hey, I'm a kid from Troy, New York, and I want to get into Hollywood. I, I have this passion that I'm discovering for myself for makeup. Um, let me take a shot and just send out these letters. Like most people don't think like that. Most people, they don't, they don't take that next step because they see the, this person as, uh, you know, hey, I can never send the president a letter and he'd write back, or I can never send this CEO. Oh, I, yeah. But people write back. And they give they people chances. Yeah, they do. I mean, what's the, why not take the shot, right? I mean, it's like, what do you have to lose? I mean, at that point when I was writing letters, I was, uh, you know, my mom and dad were divorced. And back in those days, it was, uh, the divorce courts were a little, it was a little sketchy. It didn't really, you know, my, my dad kind of disappeared for a while. So I had to work. Mm. And, you know, as a young teenager, I was mopping floors in a hospital in Troy just to, you know, kind of make sure things were running right at home, you know, because the income was tight. So, you know, it was it was ground zero, you know, for, for me. So, I mean, I really didn't have anything to lose. I was doing this makeup thing for fun and work you know, drama club in high schools, but I just figured, what, what the hell do I have to lose from where I am now? What's the, what's the, what's the you know, I might as well just go for it. And uh, did some praying. I did, and uh, you know the prayer was answered, and I got that phone call. Yeah, and that kind of started to move me in that direction. Well, I think it's cool too. You, you know, you you grab a hold of a, a a small vision of what life would be like, you know, working in this big world of of Hollywood and entertainment, and sometimes that vision could sort of again grab you and pull you out of your your current circumstances and environments, and you you make the choices. Hey, I. I have to work as a janitor. I have to. I have to do these basic jobs just to keep myself going. People yeah, and it was it was something that we had to do just to keep our heads above water. And it it taught me a work ethic very young. You know, if you're gonna if you're gonna want it and go get it, you gotta you gotta pound it. And if it meant you know working as a porter or whatever it took, it was to get to that next level really was that whatever it took i think that jams a lot of people up though because they they see it where it is that they want to go uh where mm -hmm. it is they want to go hey i want to go to the big screen or i want to go be a you know a, again a high level executive and they sort of you know maybe subconsciously see themselves as like better than some of these these jobs that they have to take in order to get there but that's a part of the process it is. I, I think it is. I mean, you've heard the famous stories of starting in the mailroom. 
where you know the guys that ran the you know, became CEOs of the big corporations started out in the mailroom. And they learned every department in the building and how the corporation ran and they worked their way right up. To the, and I've heard that story many, many times. I think it's, the, I, for me, it, it was the way to go. I mean, when I, uh, when I finally got my break, uh, when I graduated high school, I went into NBC in New York as an apprentice. The first few months, I was just stocking rooms full of makeup and taking inventory. I wasn't even really touching anyone's faces at that point. I was just learning the mechanics of keeping makeup rooms stocked and keeping makeup artists, you know, so they had supplies in their rooms. And, you know, so it was learning from the ground floor. It was just, just hit the ground running. Yeah. And, yeah. and people, again, giving you shots along the way, giving you a chance, opening doors, giving you opportunities and, yeah, I was very lucky. And you too, right? You know, just giving you a shot. Just giving you the chance to try it and uh, see how you would do. Well, yeah, I think, you know, no matter what it is, you have to have the confidence to put yourself in that position for success. And that's that's where, again, as I always tell people, like, you have to believe in yourself, right? You can't expect somebody else to believe in you before you believe in yourself. Right, exactly. You know, if... Yeah. If you're not going to gamble on yourself, who's going to gamble? Why would you expect somebody else to? It doesn't That's really right. work like that, you know? Yeah, or you're just so just, you have such tunnel vision that you just feel there's something inside you saying, there's really nothing else I know how to do. Mm. This is something that I do, I think I do well. And, uh, you know, others can decide for themselves. But you're, you're, it's almost like this, this is what I have to do. There's like no other way around it. It's kind of that situation for me. No, no, nothing to lose, right? Nothing to lose. And what else is there? I mean, if this doesn't work out, then what do I really do? Yeah. It, 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 I, was, it, I just feel like I was guided in a certain direction to follow it and to go for it. Uh, I didn't have a plan B, honestly. It was, that was it, you know? Yeah. But how, how do you learn, like, how do you learn the skill of, of makeup, right? So uh, effects makeup and, and beauty makeup. If, you know, here you are as a, a guy up in Troy, New York, and, and then you get these yeah. opportunities to sort of work in the studios, but how do you learn the actual skill so you can actually demonstrate, hey, I'm actually kind of good at this? Like, well, you learn by making a lot of mistakes, and you know, I mean, it's like, that's the best way to learn. Yeah. Uh, so being up in Troy and trying to learn how to just uh, take an impression of someone's face, because that's the first thing you do when you make uh, prosthetics for someone is you have to take a mold of their face. And uh, it was a lot of trial and error. You can even ask my big brother, Paul, who was, uh, who was uh, I, I didn't me. really know how to take a mold of someone's face. And he kind of coaxed me into doing that. And uh I used the wrong material on his face starting out. I mean, I was maybe like 14 years old. And I, I used this stuff called dental stone where uh, it gets to like 175 degrees and turns to like cement. Mm -hmm. And uh, we actually wound up going to the emergency room in Troy and two doctors had to tear the plaster cast off my brother's face. Oh my gosh. Yeah, and they, they took it. He was a musician and he had a goatee like mine and uh, they, 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 they were trying to pry it and get it off in the emergency room. And they just gave it the old heave ho. Wow. And just took his goatee and his eyebrows and everything with it. So yeah, it's, it's a lot of, uh, you know, trying things and, and failing and then hopefully learning and at nobody else's expense. You know, it's yeah. just. <laughs> sort of, a it's a common theme. You know, every person that I, that I speak with, you know, on here, even those in person that I work with, it's like, it's the failures that, that gets you to the place of success. And so many people, they play the game not to fail, but if failure is a part of the journey to where it is that you want to go, you should embrace the failure. Absolutely. I mean, it's, it's what makes you go for it try to do better next time. I mean, I mean, you've seen it in baseball. How many times do people strike out? Yeah, you know, every yeah. Bat, they're home run hitters. They're like known for their home runs. And, you know, it's just for whatever reason, it's, you know, but that's, I don't consider that real failure. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, almost motiv it's motivational, really, you know, when that happens. 
for me anyway. You know, I, I think about the other side, you know, if, if, if you never failed or everybody told you yes, like how good would you actually be, right? If everything yeah. was yes and all lights were green and everything was sort of, you know, just open road for you, it, it's, it, it wouldn't, I don't think it would be as fun. Yeah, I just don't even think that's even possible. It's not, I, but I think some people live in the state of mind. They do, you're right. Thinking that they're losing or they're failing or they're not doing as well as they should be because all the lights aren't green and there's some traffic on the road. Yeah, so exactly. They, they, they actually believe that that's how it works. But again, every person you talk to, again, whether it's, it's Hollywood, it's sports, uh, it's you know working mm -hmm. as an executive, there's a lot of resistance that has been overcome. Yeah, not just that, but the risks, you know, even never playing it safe. You know, once you get to a certain position, you, you can still take risks and grow from that and fail. I mean, it never ends, really. You know, it's a, you know, you, you can fail along the way and uh, and then learn from that. But when you keep growing, there's mm -hmm. a lot of risk and growth too. Yeah, and, you know, there's a, there's failure there, but you just keep going. What's that famous line from Kevin Plank, that one that we... Uh, oh, yeah. You got to be smart enough to be naive enough to not yeah. know what you can yeah. do. Yeah. That's so great. Yeah. Yeah, it sums it up, right? It Take really does, man. You know? Yeah. And I think that, that a lot of people can share that. I think that's... I know I can. Yeah. I, I think it all comes down to, again, I would say, like gam gambling on yourself. It's like sort of this reoccurring theme. You have to be comfortable gambling on yourself in order to go where it is that you're really, I, I say that you're supposed to go. I think a lot of people play it safe and they never actually expand their own horizon. Oh yeah. So, and then yeah. they sit back and say, man, I, you know, I wish, or I, 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 I hope, I wish I could have done this or I should have done that. Or, you know, it's sort of the old regret game. Oh, I know. I know, sure. I know people like that. I know we know, both of us know people like that. Yeah. Uh, it's just, uh, I like feeling the edge of it. Yeah, I, I, you know, it's kind of the juice for me. It, yeah, so, it, so, you know, it's a, which is sort of an interesting segue because I'm thinking about, you know, as an artist, you know, and I, I think people could relate to this, like, what do you do if you don't have a creative idea or you feel stuck? Like, you know, and you know, you have a deadline, you have to create this look or you have to create something, but sort of there's, there's like a log jam. Does that ever happen or is that? Oh something? yeah, sure. Yeah. You know, there's moments where, you know, the deadline's approaching and you just, you're not, it's not happening. It's not happening. And, uh, and then, uh, you know, you find, I don't know, I don't know how it happens, but you, I find a way to get there somehow, you know, even if it means walking away you know, like when I'm sculpting or I'm designing a character. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, you, there's, you do get blocks. Yeah. And uh, there's been many times, well, several times in my career where it, it's good enough for the actor and it's good enough for the producers and director, but for me personally, it, it just could have been something else. And it, you know, it's that, there's that balance of uh, artist and facilitator. You have to kind mm -hmm. of, you know, working in my business, it's not like it's all yours. And it's gotten less so. I mean, in my experience in the career, in the business now, it's like even less now, mm -hmm. where there's so many cooks in the kitchen, you're almost designing something for someone else. Yeah. And it's not even really yours anymore. And that I've seen that in the business. So how does it work also when, uh, I mean, it sounds like, are, well, let me ask the question a little differently. Is there something, has there ever been a time where you're like, I nailed it? Oh, yeah, right? I mean, sure, there's times, yeah. Okay. Yeah, where you're like, that's, that's, that was it. And we, we got that right. Sure, yeah. There's, okay. There's films. Some, there's you know, experiences, some, yeah. Some people are such perfectionists that it's sort of like, we're not even perfectionists. Sometimes they're, they're just, they beat themselves up where nothing's ever good enough they see it and, and everyone says it's great but they feel like it could have been better well yeah i guess you know like some actors some people can't even look at their performances they feel that that they they delivered that day on the set and it's filmed 
And once the film goes out, it's really none of their business anymore. And uh, so, yeah, you, you can always look back and say, ah, you could have been better. Uh, but it is what it is. And it's, you know, f what do they say? Pain is temporary, film is forever. So it's like, that's it. You have to let it go. You have to let it go psychologically and, and physically. You just have to just let it go. We were watching Heat last night, the movie Heat. Uh, with De Niro and Pacino. And there's not a whole ton of makeup in it, but there's uh, there's some fun makeups that I still look at. And that was 1995. And I was like, yeah, that's still, that holds up to today. I was, I was happy with that. And just being a part of the film, like my work may not be a major contributor to the film. Like Dick Tracy, the makeup was very important to the look of the film because the Chester Gould comic book, Dick Tracy, the rogues gallery of villains was very important to the comic strip. Mm -hmm. So that was, those films for me anyway, happened very f kind of far and in between. And yeah. uh, like films like Dick Tracy, where the, the character, the cartoon makeups are important to the, the fabric of the film. And uh, The Dark Knight with Heath Ledger, where you know I did the Joker. Mm -hmm. And that's very important to the look of that character. But films like Heat, I, we were looking at it last night, me and Helen, and, and uh, it's not a lot of makeup, but there's so many great memories about being a part of that film that for me, it's just like, so it's not grandstanding makeup, but you're part of something else. Yeah. And it's fun. You know, what it's I find fun. too is, uh, you know, the, the role of makeup artist that seems to have a lot of similarities to, you know, performance coaching, what I do in that, you know, you're, for me, it's you're paid to make an athlete stronger, a person stronger, a mentally stronger, yeah. physically stronger. Yeah. And then for you on your end, the job is to, you know, obviously apply makeup and, and, and get the actor ready. But I would think that because it's you preparation. have somebody, Yeah. Yeah. You, but you have somebody in your chair for whatever, 30 minutes, an hour, you know, mm -hmm. got to go deeper than just the application of makeup. I would think you have an opportunity to really help somebody get themselves aligned, ready, even therapy at times, talking to people. It's, exactly, it's a, we share the same common goal. It's the preparation of getting the athlete ready. Mm -hmm. And I, I think actors, a lot of actors and actresses are like athletes. They're coming in in the morning, they're, they're, they're getting their gear on, they're starting to warm up and uh, you're setting a tone for them. And uh, you know, the actor's muscles is, their feelings and their vibes and it's not and movements so yeah. it's very simple dana that's great it's a very similar conditioning process i think in a lot of ways well you know because again like like my role with athletes is unique in that we would spend you know the most time with the player than anybody else on the on the staff and i'm guessing makeup is very similar you're getting a chance to have this sort of uninterrupted time with an actor yeah sorting to like get their get their mind ready to perform and do what they have to do which is a very much a neat role that's right yeah and and you're there throughout the entire day i mean you 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 get on the field you're warming up the athletes you're stretching them out for us when they go in for close-ups we're right in in the actor's face doing you know doing our touches and getting them really set and uh you're setting a tone. You're helping them set a tone for themselves. Yeah, I think I think for most people too, they you know um, they don't know what goes into really building a film. And you know the, the few times that I've been on a set, I, I didn't know what went into it before. Yeah. You know, for me, it's like, hey, the movie's coming out in uh, in early May, and you pay your seventeen fifty, and you go see the movie, and you say that's a great movie. Seventeen fifty. Yeah. yeah, I know it's crazy. And then two hours later. It's like you're on to your next thing, maybe at the diner or something, but it's like months <laughs> went into building this picture and every detail is, is there. And I think a lot of people don't realize just the time component that goes into making a, a, a film and making a movie. Yeah, and how many people have to just, all that timing has to come down to a moment the camera department and the lighting department and the makeup and hair people and the costume but yeah it's really a lot of elements that come together and then yeah. it's the performance and the writing and there's so many different you know parts of the puzzle that have to fit 
Uh, well, you were on the set. How did it feel being on the set? What did you, I, what well, did you think of the, yeah, the chaos? I, yeah, I mean, we um, went on the set of The Irishman, and, and what was cool was, I mean, it, there's an energy there. It's a, for me, it's a very different energy than sports. Um, yeah. To be honest with you, I felt a lot of like, like sports is a very aggressive, like, let's go get it. Let's go bring it home. Yeah. But, but the movie set was a little bit more, um, I don't know, it was a little like everybody was kind of a little more independent and just doing their mm -hmm. thing. And, but, but that was just what I saw. But, uh, but then I said, you know, there has to be some levels of connectivity amongst everybody, I would think, in order to make this whole thing come together. Or is it actually more, in, is it independent? Like I, like I saw the first time. Yeah, well, it, you know, it, it ebbs and flows, mm -hmm. the independence. Um, but on the set of The Irishman, at least for me, there wasn't a lot to do with Al Pacino. Yeah. Because what they did with him, they did it digitally in post-production to de-age okay. him. So it was a little more of a mellow, you know, set. Um, but, uh, you know, in any given moment, all hell can break loose, you know, where uh, the lighting isn't right or the camera, you know, calls you in to powder someone's face or this doesn't look right or this looks artificial. And before you know it, you've got like 20 people on a set trying to fix a problem. So there's moments of just complete lull and then there's moments of you just never know where it's going to happen. Yeah. Well, the other side of it was I, I, I was very... Um... I guess surprised and impressed as to like how patient everybody is. There's a lot of patience being shown to, you know, when you have to reshoot something two, three times or, you know, uh, yeah. it, you know, it's just, I didn't realize yeah. the time component that went into, you know, just one scene or a part of a scene. Oh, I know. I listen, hey man, when, when I was starting in the business, in the very beginning, being up in Troy, I had a little bedroom set up. And I was just basically doing makeup on myself and a couple of my friends, you know, but it was basically me in front of a mirror. And then all of a sudden I got hired to, to go work on Saturday night live. And I, then I, I kind of panicked because I had to work with other people. Yeah. I mean, a lot of other people, you know, it's like working in my bedroom, uh, you yeah. know, doing monsters. And then all of a sudden I had to work with actors it didn't even like kind of dawn on me that I had to like interact with all these different personalities. And uh, so, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it could, it could be a little nerve wracking when you make that transition. It's sort of like going to the big leagues, you know, you're going from the minor leagues to the big leagues for you, you're going from the bedroom to all of a sudden a real, a real set where- Going, where, from, the, going from the cave, you know? It's yeah. like going from a cave to civilization, like a big city. So insane. what do you do? What do you tell yourself as you're sort of making the transition from like these lower ranks to to the higher ranks of like, all right, well now I have to work on some real actors as opposed to just my friend, you know? Yeah, you, I think you just you do what you do when you're young. You just try to absorb like-minded people around you. You're trying to see what they're doing and trying to kind of mimic it. And try yeah, to, try to create yourself in that environment. And uh, so, yeah. yeah, it's 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 like what I said earlier, hit the ground running, man. You just go yeah. for it. Which and is, there was nothing else behind me. So it was like, this this has to work out. There's like mm -hmm. no other way that this has to work. So, so I'll make you, it work. What, what would you say um, now that you've sort of moved yourself through, what, what's the most exciting part of your business? Like, what do you enjoy the most? I mean, you've been doing it for a while now. You're kind of on the other side of it. You know, yeah. you're a young, hungry guy, and then you you work through the business, and now you're on the other side. Like, what do you enjoy most about the business of Hollywood and um, you know, film and all that? I for I I I've always enjoyed the um, like never knowing what's going to have come next. That's mm -hmm. kind of a fun thing for me. Um, like, there's been so many types of films I've worked on. Uh, the subject matter is always different. It's never, you know, it's, there's some that are the same, like I've done Donnie Brasco and I did the Irishman gang pictures about gangsters. Mm -hmm. uh, but you learn so much on every film and that's always exciting. And then there's all these kind of makeup problems you have to work out. But 
you you learn so much. Yeah, I mean, years and years ago, I did uh, this movie called Quest for Fire, and it was all about early man. It was Neanderthals, and we. I was like 22 years old, and my, I was doing it with my buddy. And so, you, you know, you just never know what's around the corner, and that's always exciting. Which is um, crazy because that's what most people are are scared to death of. I love it. Like, <laughs> yeah, I, I guess, can't yeah, say right. you know, people I talk to on a day to day basis where their whole life they're just trying to create certainty for themselves and and stability. Yeah. And you know, you're basically saying, "Hey, no, I I sort of like not knowing what's around." the turns or, you know, cause your business too, it really, you have to have work. Work isn't yeah. guaranteed. So no, there's it's not. everywhere. And then you have to be a great secure artist with all that uncertainty going with on. With all that insecurity. Kind of yeah. Weird but place you know, to be. In my business, in my business, we're, everyone's sharing those same problems. You just know that all these other technicians and all these other people are uh, working and then may not be working for months. So we all share that common commonality, even actors. I mean, yeah. there's really like maybe only, it's maybe a hundred actors that are really famous and work a lot, but there's so many thousands of actors mm. that, you know, it's, you're as good as your last job. So, but, so what does everybody do to sort of keep themselves at bay and not, not succumb to like, oh my gosh, you know, I don't, I don't have work or even people today, like we can relate it to where people are now. It's like, oh my gosh, you know, my business is in the middle of this chaos. Like, how do you deal with yeah. that sort of uncertainty? I think people, yeah. people could appreciate that now. Well, I think what's, what's going on with this whole thing with COVID, you know, for, I think I've been training for this my whole career. Mm. because there have been real droughts in my career where it's been like months without work. And, you know, you're married to my daughter. There, she could tell you stories where I was like packing your lunch for like three months. And it's like, dad, are you going to go to work soon? You know? <laughs> um, so I, I've been kind of like, this has been this whole, you know, lockdown. I've been kind of training for it my whole life. I'm kind of geared to well, I can't go to the gym. I've got a little thing going on in the garage to do a little workout. But when I'm off, I'm sculpting. I'm doing stuff for myself. I'm, I'm doing these newsletters and writing. Hmm. Uh, and, and I hit Planet Fitness over in Quorum over here. And, you know, you just got to keep your mind and your body going. Yeah, I think I, I enjoy that. I enjoy it. I've always loved, I've always been kind of athletic. Hmm. And uh, even, you know, when I was doing makeup, I was playing basketball, I was playing football. My brother was a park supervisor, you know, recreation supervisor, my older brother. And so I was kind of raised, I was kind of a weird kid growing up because I, I loved football. I loved basketball. I loved track and field. I ran, you know, Junior Olympics track and field upstate. And I liked makeup. I loved monster makeup. So I was kind yeah. of this it's crazy this, combo. This crazy combo going on. So yeah, I, you know, when I'm not doing makeup or I'm not sculpting and designing, I'm, I'm in Planet Fitness working out. It feels great, you know. Yeah, I, I think that's that's something that, that people don't realize is like, I, you know, when I, when I was a young guy, and not that I'm old, but but you you have this sort of perception of what people at the highest level do. And you think that they're working all the time, like right. just working and working. And when they're not working, they're thinking about work, but that's, yes. <laughs> that's really not true for a lot of people. It's not that they're not thinking about it, but they have a life outside of, of work. And I find today a lot of like the resources that are out there for people that talk about like how to be successful. And it's like all about these like crazy routines and this, this, this just, you're always going mm -hmm. to be on and working and, and, and it's not the case. I mean, it's yeah. Just, I agree. I, you know, now later in my life, now it's, you know, in my early 60s, 62 now, I think it's all for me, it all connects, you know, raising a family, you know, getting married, having a career, uh, you know, the, the business, all of it, it seems to be like one thing to me. Hmm. There's really no separation anymore for me. It's all an extension of my life. I, I it is your life, right? <laughs> it is. It's not. I, I used to think it was you compart. You do this, and then you do that. You do your work. You, it, now it seems to me, anyway, that it's all one thing. 
and yeah. there's no separation between any of it really. I think there's sort of a false reality that's sold to people where it's like you literally go on off on off on off and yeah it's not it's like when you feel something that's when you you can take action but there's such integration between everything that you do and that's the balance keeping everything integrated in a healthy way that's balance not mm -hmm. you know, saying I'm on and then I'm off and it's because it, it's it's hard to, to do that yeah, how can you be on and off? I mean, are you enjoying everything? Yeah. Because for a long time, I wasn't. And I think that I've kind of learned in the last 15 to 20 years to make it all one thing so that I could just enjoy it all very much because I, I think I missed out on some of the things. Yeah. And as I guess as you get older, you, re you, know, you try to keep it all one thing so you can kind of just stay in tune to all of it at the same time. Yeah. and enjoy it and be grateful for it too, you know, which I am, you so, know. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, so, so for people out there that are, that are sort of struggling with like, I guess we'll say balance, but also um, wondering when the that balance. next job is going to come, you know, what are, what would you say to that? Like if you go back to when you were maybe younger in your career, now you're at the point where you get it and you understand it. But if you go back, like how would you talk to your younger self if you will, um, you know, when you were stressing about how am I going to pay the mortgage because I don't have a job yeah. right <laughs> Yeah, well, you know, uh, I was very lucky. I very early on surrounded myself with some really great people that kind of helped me through these. But, you know, you know, Helen, my wife, really, I, I don't think I would have been able to handle those droughts without her, you, you know, to have a good to have a good mastermind group, I guess, if you want to call it. Yeah. I was very, very lucky, you know, having great daughters around me and my, and Helen, who would always uh, say, don't worry about it. We're going to be okay. You know, just, just that, just as simple as that. Well, you know, we got the mortgage coming up and yeah. I don't know, you know, I need a job and everything you worry about as a young guy. And she would just say, we're going to be okay. Don't worry about it. And you know what, man? It, we, it came close a couple of times, but, you know, it, I got the call. It, it, something well, happened. It, it helps when your mother-in-law is a multimillionaire. Oh, yeah, that's what I used to say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, little did I know. I don't, you know. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. No, I would. Maybe, I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but I would wonder, because, you know, Helen would be like, John, don't worry. It's going to be all right. And I'd be like, does she have like millions socked away somewhere that I don't know? I don't know yeah. about this. I, you know, but she, you know, kind of got me to relax. And uh, thank God it worked out. And, you know, so far so good, 42 years later. Yeah, you just trust, yeah. trust the process and the ebbs and flow of the process. Yeah, trust the, uh, you know, trust the universe, man, you know. Um, I'll tell you, back in Troy, when I was mopping floors, I don't want to get too holy roller here, but there was a night where like everything was, all hell was breaking loose in my life. And, you know, I was at a crossroads and, you know, I just, uh, I sent one up there, a real hard prayer, please God help me. Cause I, you know, I don't know what we're going to do here. And then, you know, that phone rang, I, you know, listen, it, it, call, call it luck or whatever, but um that prayer got answered you know it was just not long after that that dick smith called me on the phone and just kind of things started to roll so i'm kind of in between uh, the practical and maybe more metaphysical now in my life yeah. i've seen too many miracles happen to deny them you know yeah. just for me personally for other people whatever works that's great but me personally there's too many things that don't seem to be accidents. I don't know. You know? Yeah. Yeah. No, we had an epic conversation about that last night at the, at the table. Did you? But, uh, Did you? Yeah. It was, it was pretty fun. But, you know, for, for you, what would you say is like, you know, I think in each of our careers, there's sort of this, uh, this moment where we sort of catch our first break. What would you say it was for you? Well, you know, I think getting into NBC and working with the cast, the original cast of Saturday Night Live, uh, that, you know, that was a big break. I mean, my, that was my foot in the door. Hmm. And, uh, and then I did some really cool films with Woody Allen along the way. And then 
uh, when I got the job in Hollywood, to, Warren Beatty hired me to do Dick Tracy and design the character makeups that, you know, that led to winning an Academy Award. So I think those two things kind of, you know, winning the Oscar was kind of like, in my field, winning, you know, earning a PhD, yeah. I guess. And uh, you're kind of, you know, a uh, good housekeeping seal of approval. And uh, so th that, I think those two, those two moments were big. Yeah. And in now modern day, the film, The Dark Knight was a big, big success and Heath Ledger was amazing. And uh, that the makeup and his performance were pivotal. So uh, yeah. th those three, I think were the big ones for me. Which, I, you know, I, I find, um like that look to be uh, very well recognized. You know, a lot of people know, you know, Halloween every year, you sort of see that, oh, yeah. that Joker makeup. And I think a lot of people would want to know, like, you know, how do you create a look like that? How do you create a look? How does, what goes into it? Like, what's the thought process? And then what are the sort of action steps? Yeah, well, um, yeah, when I first, when I got the script, and I met Christopher Nolan, the director. Everything in that movie is real. It's organic. It's it's not like a big comic book film. And that was his approach to that look, that design ethic of the film. So with that in mind, going to London to do tests on Heath in the in the, the clown makeup, uh, Christopher Nolan would bring in books of, and he was just a, he's an incredible director. Christopher Nolan is so good. He doesn't tell you. This is exactly what I want. He gives you source material mm. of other artists that inspire him to for okay. a certain look. And through the actor and the director, he guides you to come to where he thinks it should rest. That's and cool. so, yeah, that every director is a little different on how they put it together. But we were looking at uh, paintings of this guy named Francis Bacon, and they're very dreary you know, kind of muted paintings. And so that was kind of our, for, for us, for, for me and Heath, that was kind of what we had in mind to do this very dreary, broken down makeup. Because this Joker, uh, he sleeps in his makeup for like a week, he's a psychopath. He doesn't wash his hair, he doesn't change, in the movie he never changes his clothes. They mm -hmm. just become more broken down. So that with all that, that's how you wind up with that kind of design. Yeah, I mean, did it come to you quickly or was it something that you had to sort of run a couple renditions of before? No, you we, we had to do a few renditions, you know? I mean, as a makeup artist, you're classically trained. Like you think, oh, clown makeup. So I'm gonna make, if you look at clowns, Tight every line, makeup. it's very, very painted and very, you know, stylized. Mm. And this, this clown makeup had to be the complete other side of that. So it took a few, it took a few, maybe four or five makeup tests to get to a, just a basic look for that makeup. Yeah. And I'll tell you the truth, when we started shooting um, the film, like the first few days, I would look at, I'd be off camera looking at Heath doing his performance and I'd be saying to myself, this is the worst makeup in the world. Like, it's like, it's just, it looks, you know, it looks, I don't know. And they, they knew that it was gonna work and it worked. Yeah, I think sort of that distressed look is probably what made the distressed it look. so um, so appealing to many. It was like it took that, like you said, the fine lines of a typical clown and really made it a clown that was was whacked. Yeah, and then you have a great actor where, you know, everything, all the elements just come, to, all the stars align. And mm -hmm. it doesn't happen, I mean, at least in my career, it ha hasn't happened too many times where all those elements come together and then you have a great actor like Heath Ledger and mm. a great director like Christopher Nolan. And it's just, you hit, you hit it. Yeah. And it's, it's just perfect the way it is. What, what would you say is, is your favorite, um, I guess, uh, what's your favorite work? Like what, what have you created that you, that you've liked the best? Oh, oh man. You know, it's, I don't know if it's so much the work, it's the, the whole, feeling of it for me now you know i think the best thing that's ever really happened to me through all of it was getting to meet and work with al pacino for 30 years mm. you know being his makeup artist of choice and yeah. going going on that journey with him 
through you know through his career uh, from Dick Tracy where we where he was in Dick Tracy all the way through you know the Donnie Brasco and you don't know Jack and Phil Spector all the way up to when we just did this TV thing for Amazon called Hunters that has been it kind of encapsulates my career being being his makeup artist that is like you know you talk about the ups and downs of a career the Al Pacino career is just straight through that it's like yeah. one line that goes straight through and that will probably it, I know it will never happen with with another actor yeah and yeah. what an incredible actor for that to happen with you know it's just just incredible <laughs> It's interesting because I, I know like, you know, again, that sort of, uh, again, the, the work you're saying is not oftentimes very predictable, but it's nice to have something like, you know, a relationship with a star like an Al Pacino, yeah. that you know, that, that he's got me and I got yeah. sort of keeps you, it is that straight line that connects it all right. It the really middle. is. And it's so rare in it. I, in, in show business to have an actor of that, magnitude to have that much trust and faith and loyalty in you which you know like just on those levels it probably will never ever happen to me again mm -hmm. and uh the guys really helped me out professionally so, and personally what what do you think drives the connectivity of an al pacino relationship i don't know i still don't <laughs> understand it um <laughs> He may actually like you, believe it or not. Uh, yeah, it may. I, I don't know why. <laughs> I, I don't get it. But um, no, it's funny. I don't know. I, I just, I kind of caught on to his working style very early on. I got, kind of understood the method actor that he is or was. He's less of that now. But mm -hmm. um, very early on, uh, we were doing this movie, Donnie Brasco, where he plays a low level mafia guy. And um, he was using me as the Johnny Depp character when Johnny Depp wasn't around. So he, you know, he was, Johnny Depp's character was very subservient to Al Pacino's character. So on the set, he would pick on me. Mm. And, and, but I knew that he was using me to, you know, kind of get him to relax and be his character. So, you know, those are things I figured out with Al over the years. And so maybe that's part of it. Yeah, it's always, you know, there's always these unique things that keep people together. Yeah. yeah, I mean, for you, like working with those athletes, you know, you just, some people you just groove into and then some yeah. you just, there's a chemistry that just doesn't, for whatever reason, just, you know. Yeah, no, I can see it. Is, is there a, a favorite movie, though, that you've worked on? Uh, yeah, oh, geez, you know. Well, Donnie Brasco was a lot of fun. I mean, there's yeah. really like no makeup in it, but <laughs> that, that was a blast. I, I guess Dick Tracy was you know, because that's where it all kind of blossomed for me in film. Uh, meeting Al Pacino, Warren Beatty hired me, brought me to Hollywood. I was in New York uh, in those days, in the, you know, like 1988, 89, not a lot of makeup artists from New York traveled to Hollywood and worked in pictures there. So on lots of levels, that was a big uh, career break for me. Yeah. And then the Academy Award and all that stuff that went along with it. But out of that Dick Tracy, Al Pacino. Yeah, that's true. Which, that's which again, is like sort of this one movie gives you an opportunity to have work for the next, what, 30 years? Still till like last... Still going. Like the end of last year, we were working together. Yeah. No, it's, so, it's, it's pretty cool. We never know when we're going to catch, catch that break, you know? And, and wow. I, I think it's cool, too, that, you know, who thinks, you know, you think of a, being a makeup artist... And it's like, wow, like that sounds really cool. I can actually make that a career. And I think people forget that there's like these great opportunities out there for, for all of us. And, and that's right. It starts with sort of that itch that you get and what's that passion yep. you have and take the itch, take the passion and then take the risk on, on yourself. That's it. That just those three things. That's it. Just, uh, you know, what do you got to lose, man? I mean, what do you have to lose? Nothing, really. Just go for it. You know, it see what see what happens. Take take the shot. Take the shot. You you can live with that. Yeah. So I I have just a couple quick ones, but you know at the end you know now you're again I I say on the other side still doing it, but not sort of that young and naive 
guy that's sort of just going through the process. Um, you know, what, what keeps you excited and inspired today, you know, through this Hollywood journey? Yeah, it's just like, uh, I, you know, I've done, I've done more than I've ever thought I'd ever do with in the business. I, I just, you know, it's like beyond the dream, everything that I've done. So right now it's just, uh, you know, just it, it, taking it one day at a time, basically, really it is. I don't mean to sound hokey, but just enjoying today just enjoying right now. And uh, if my career has taught me anything, there's going to be a tomorrow, you know, uh, God willing, there'll be a tomorrow and, uh, and there'll be, a, there'll be something for me to do there. But, you know, I'm always practicing my sculpture, you know, I'm always working on that little things in, in the shop and mm. uh, trying to keep my chops on that because sculpture is very important to, you know, prosthetic makeup. And, uh, you know, I'm writing these newsletters and you're an inspiration for that and Lauren, you know, so that's something that's, uh, you know, taking me out of my comfort zone. I, I, I don't get to write too much. So those are fun. I do those once a month and they're great. They're on, on my, uh, my website. Yeah. And uh, just trying to, and, you know, trying to hit the gym and stay active and keep my body and my mind in shape. And just, you know, I'm just going for today, man. You know, so, now. cause I want to ask you this though, like in, in, uh, in where you are, or maybe a little before this, like, were you somebody that set like hard goals for yourself? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, early on, I was very much like totally driven. You know, I, I, yeah. I, my wife can tell you. You know, I, she was like, "This guy is possessed. He's just, <laughs> just that's it. The, nothing else really mattered to me very early on. It was just all about the business, all about the work." working around the clock, trying to make it even better in the shop. I would let my crew go home so I could sculpt and design on my own, working around the clock. So yeah, I was very driven very early on. That's, yeah. I think you have to be to a certain extent. Yeah, so there was a, an obsessive. You have to have, yeah, yeah, you have to have tunnel vision. Uh, yeah. Definitely, no doubt about it. I guess it's too, it's important to keep people around you that understand your pursuits yeah yeah you try to just you try to you know tether yourself in reality at least i did by having a family and trying to be there as much as possible so that was always kind of bringing me back from the the yeah. dream factory of hollywood which is interesting because again today that seems to be something that a lot of people avoid right they say like if i'm gonna pursue my career and attack my career i can't have a family or i can't do that because it's They'll take me too far away. I know. Yeah. Isn't that wild? Yeah. yeah. Interesting thought process. Yeah. No, it always drew, drew me back to reality. You know, uh, I would sculpt this incredible creature in my shop and then Helen would say, John, it's garbage night. You got to take the garbage out. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's like, it's, it's, you know, it brings your, it's your reality check. Yeah. And uh, I think it really, it really helped me out. It really did. Uh, that's good. So yeah. I, I, I'll ask, I have two more, two more, <laughs> two more quickies, but the, the, the one that I, it's like for people that are sort of, I'd say sitting in a place where they're excited about something, but they're not taking action because they're nervous or they're scared or they're not sure of themselves. Is there anything that you would say to them um, to sort of get them going? Yeah, just tr st start doing it, whatever it is, you know, you, you don't have to take Hollywood by storm tomorrow, but mm -hmm. just if it's acting or whatever you're, you know, feeling the itch to do, just start doing it little by little. I mean, just, just take the first few step steps toward it in any way you can. That's within your reach. I mean, it's all there. I mean, there's so much out there now on the internet. We didn't have the internet in 19... 73 i mean it was just like there was, there was there was not much you know so there's a lot out there to kind of just look and check out and be inspired by right um yeah just don't don't go for the whole jump just take it once you know go you know you know take a little taste and see if you know if, if that's for you yeah and uh you know just like i i've said like maybe four times just go you know what do you got to lose R really at this you know what's you know don't be afraid to fail yeah that may be one fails. what do you got to lose yeah yeah i it's true right i mean i think we're, we judge ourselves and how others are going to 
perceive us and what we do and how we do it. Yeah, we're always looking outside ourselves, right? You're trying to look through other people's eyes. I think you have to just kind of throw that out. Yeah. You know? And then the people that tell you you can't do it or you're never going to make it. or if, I had a lot of those people very early on. Oh, you're, you're not, not going to make it. There's, there's no chance. You're, you're, you're living in the fantasy world. Yeah. You, you know, some people will run the other way. And people like me, you know, kooky people, will just use that as fuel. Yeah. Like, tell me more. You know, tell me more. I can't do that. This is great. You know, it's, yeah. it's motivation. So uh, anything you can use to try to get there. Yeah, it's just anything. It's amazing how pe we, we can use those. For, people are interesting. We could use them as fuel. Or for some people, they get burned by the fire that other people sort of yeah. point at them, you know? But you got to yeah. keep running. So my, my last question is this. You know, before I, I end every show, I, uh, I, uh -oh. ask, this question. Uh -oh. I ask this I'm, question. It's a, I'm nervous. It's a, no, I don't. But, you know, so I, the show I call the Becoming a Champion show, I always ask, what is what does the word champion, you know, mean to you? And I think, you know, I have a lot of sports guys on and they give their definition, but I, I always yeah, like, yeah, I mean, what, yeah, I don't, I don't, yeah. What is a champion to me? There's no wrong answers. It's sort of this open-ended question, you know? Yeah. I thought you were going to ask me that kind of a question like that. So you should be prepared. <laughs> I think I'm still in the rookies, man. I don't know. I don't, you yeah. know, I'm still trying to attain it. I, I, you know, I. Yeah. Well, I mean, that can be part of it, you know, like a champion is somebody that is always working as if they are a rookie and, and trying to get to that next place. Yeah. I think you have to, if for everybody, you, you, you're defining what is a champion. Everyone's definition of champion, I guess, is, you know, it's different. Yeah. It's, it's for some people, it's, having a big corporation or, you know, driving great cars or, you know, or, you know, or having a lot of money. I, you know, for me, I don't know if that's, that's being a champion for me anyway, you know, it's, I don't know. Just, I want people to tell some good stories about me. I think, you know, yeah. when it's all said and done. I think that's. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, it's interesting out of all the people I've asked about, Hey, what does champion mean to you? What does it mean to be a champion? You know, not one person said it's like, well, it's about this, this thing or this material thing, or it's about, you know, a certain amount of money, right? Yeah. But yeah. so many people are pursuing a certain amount of money or certain things. But again, every person I ask that question to, not one person has, has said it's about that. It's about That's interesting. a pursuit. Wow. It's about a journey. It's about um, a legacy. It's about, you know, the dialogue that people have about me and my work when I'm not here anymore. Like these are the themes yeah. that, I, that, I've, that I've asked that question to, what is a champion? And that's what they, that's what they say. Huh. So it's amazing because how many people get stressed during their champion's journey trying to acquire all of these things when in yeah. the end, that won't even be the answer to the question, what, what is exactly. a Exactly, yeah, wow. So I guess we're in pretty good company because we still can't really totally define it. I don't know. It's, no. a, it's, the, it's the search. Yeah. You know, it's a search for excellence. What is that? How, how do you know you've arrived at that? I mean, yeah. It's always shifting and changing for us. You know, it's like. There's yeah. no destination, right? It's sort of. There's that, no destination, man. No. Yeah. It's, it's, it's it. that that journey and, and make your journey your own, right? Make it proprietary to you and, and, you know, make the left turns, make the right turns, you know, when you right. get the straight away, you know, hit the gas, throw that sucker in fifth and go. Yeah. But there's no, and this is what I crazy, you know, when I asked the question, right? Um, what is a champion? You know, what is it through your eyes? And I always say there's no wrong answers. And that's the truth. As you go through your journey, I mean, steering clear of some of the obstacles that we know are not that great for us or oh it's always advised but even if you take a few hits along the way that's that's your journey that's your champion's journey it is it's all part of the championship season i guess it is you know yeah it's just it's on we go you know yeah maybe totally. we'll make it one day yeah no absolutely maybe, maybe we'll be champions one day yeah that's the fun part trying totally. to get there so that's all we could hope for. And speaking that's of, it, man. The journey. I, 
I, I know that you're doing a monthly newsletter now. So what I'll do is I'll put a link for uh, everybody that listened to this tonight so they can, oh, they can great. sign up and follow the journey. And, you know, I know there's people from all different walks of life that listen to this. Some are educators, some are in sports, you know, some are coaches, some are, again, executives. Maybe there's even some Hollywood people. But You mean someone's listening to this right now? Yeah, we got to, we got ten people right now live. It's been I thought live. it was just me and you, man. I didn't know that other no, people. No, that's were. The, that's that's the trickery. So oh I, my uh, gosh, oh. yeah, I should have invited people to ask some questions along the way, but that's why I keep looking down because I get to see how many people are are, are tracking this or a part of this. So if anybody has any questions, you know, feel free to to write in. But I think it's good to to bring on people from all different walks of life. Yeah. Um, and we could learn from all different people, all different journeys, all different fields. And, and we could really uh, sort of take all of this knowledge and experience. And, and we never know when we're going to say, hey, you know what? I remember this makeup artist said, and then we can apply it as a, as a tool yeah. for when we face a situation that may be similar to something that you faced, you know? Well, listen, man, you're saying it. And, and metaphysically, it's we're part of the same field. Hawkins. We're in this world. It's Hawkins, baby. It's David Hawkins right there. That's right. David we're Hawkins. In, we're in the field. Yeah, interested. David Hawkins, legend. David Hawkins, check him out. You know, power <laughs> versus force. Yeah. It's all there, man. You know, you want to be a champion? Read that book. Start there. Oh, you we start, we start with this book, too. Okay, so go start there and then go to, yes, that, that'll lead you to David, David Hawkins. Well, you know, man, you're the one that turned me on to David Hawkins. Yeah, no, it was the one. I we were uh, Lauren and I. We were in a we were in Calabasas, California, and I nice navigating around the bookstore, and I saw yeah. this book, and I was like, uh, that sounds like a book I I'd, I'd sort of like to read." So I picked yeah. it up and you know started reading and said, "There's some good value in here." And and I got to tell you, I haven't even gotten through the full book yet myself. It's so, a tough read, man. It's hard to apply to today's modern world. It's, you got to let go of a lot of stuff. It's hard, you know, yeah. as human beings. Like we're so geared to, we're so tethered to the planet, you know, and this is a little, you know, you know, getting, getting out into the field and realizing that we're all connected. It's all the same thing. Yeah. Everything. It's energy, like, flowing it's energy. energy. That's it. Me well, and you. I and love them. it. Cool. And everybody. Yeah. <laughs> Hawkins, he's alive. We're just doing different things with it, man. We're yeah, just, it's know, true. We're all don't, made up of, you know, trying to just do different things with the same thing, you know? Just don't, don't waste your energy thinking about the things that don't matter, right? Don't go for force, go for power. Yeah, I That's like it. it. I got to dig into yeah. that book. I still have that one on my, on my desk. <laughs> so, cool. Well, thank you all for right. being on. I know uh, everybody appreciated it. We had a pretty good attendance I was tracking on my end so we had a oh, good, good a good crowd and if any questions come through they'll they'll ask on the feed and then we'll we'll send them to your newsletter and um excellent it's been a great night thank you for this opportunity Dana I love you thank you so you much it. Too. we'll see you uh we'll see you soon we have a virtual dinner coming up I think let's do it <laughs> let's do it that'll be a first all right, cool. All right, Dana. Have a great night. Thank thanks, you, everyone. Thanks everybody. for having me. Marianne, Joanne, and everybody in between. Cool. We'll see you guys later. It was a pleasure. Thanks. All right. See thanks. Ya. Take care. Cool. Bye. Bye-bye.